Good morning, friends. I feel <coughs> pleased and privileged to participate in AWARE's uh, Outlook uh, on Agriculture 2013 conference. Uh, it has been a great learning for me uh, to listen to the experts, farmer representative, and other stakeholders, and to get first-hand information on Australian economy, Australian trade, and Australian agriculture and farmers. I find uh, there is a contrast between Australia and India, not in, the, in agriculture, in many other aspects, but I find this contrast is quite strong. In agriculture, we have very small land, but so many people in agriculture, and you have relatively, I think, very, very large land, but very few people in agriculture. So your farm size, I find that you consider 2,000 hectare not as a big farm, but in India, 2,000 hectares may be operated by 2,000 farm families. So that is the kind of uh, contrast and also many other type of contrast. But I find that despite these contrasts, the problems and issues facing agriculture in these two countries are common. You have problem of youth not interested in staying in agriculture. We face same problems. Many young people from wealthy, rich families in progressive area of Punjab, they prefer to work in menial job in Australia than to work at farm in back in North India, where they could earn much more, but they don't have taste for agriculture. Maybe same type of problem that young generation in Australia also not interested to stay in agriculture. We have problem of low farm income, low farm prices, droughts, uh, floods, and, um, and uh, I would say that, uh, that agriculture in Australia and India, um, we need to improve resilience. So risk is so high in agriculture in, at, at both the places. So I find that uh, there is a lot in common and uh, also problem and issue. So there is, a, there, is a, there, there is a learning for each other from it. Since I said that there is a contrast, so I feel for this audience, it will be uh, relevant if I give a snapshot of uh, just a sort of overview of Indian agriculture because many people I find particularly in West, they have stereotype image of India. India is no more a country of snake charmer, though we have still snake charmer at places of tourist interest. So a lot of changes have taken place in India, particularly last uh, two decades after we started economic reforms in 1991, and our economy um, annually increased at more than 7% per year. So uh, agriculture uh, accounts for about 14% uh, of our total GDP, but share of agriculture is declining very rapidly because non-agriculture sector is growing at uh, more than 8% and agriculture is growing at 2.8% uh, like that. But we face a problem that uh, while share of agriculture in GDP is declining, but workforce is not moving out of agriculture to the same extent. There's very slow movement. So, Agriculture is the principal occupation still for more than half of our workforce and the majority of rural households, the agriculture is the source of livelihood for them. We are trying to diversify rural economy through our farm employment, agriculture industrialization, agro-processing, but still that, that movement of labor force from out of agriculture to non-agriculture is, is slow. Just like Australia, our agriculture export accounts for about 13% of uh, total export of India and imports are only 3% of total import of India. But in terms of number, I think we are at same level, $37 billion US dollar export and, uh, and uh, import dollar just uh, 17 billion. So agriculture is a net foreign exchange earner to the extent of 20 billion. In fact, according to some estimates, our exports would have been close to $45 billion if our government has not put restrictions on export of grain, sugar, cotton, like onion, like that. 
So right now, despite that, because we consider food security of 1.2 billion people as of primary importance, more importance than trade. So trade, there are sometimes restriction on export. Then smallholders dominance, just like rest of Asia, our farm size is just 1.2 uh, hectares, and uh, we have 120 million farmers, and 80% uh, of the farmers, they operate less than uh, two hectare farm size, and some of them make livelihood just from one hectare. We follow mixed crop livestock farming, that is a farm of just uh, two hectare, keeping uh, two buffaloes, one cow and bullock, and like that. And that has sustained that farmyard manure, cow dung, and crop residue as a input for livestock. So that mixed farming system has, has, has been in practice uh, since time immemorial. Use of this uh, modern input is low, particularly seed is low, 60% rain fed, and, uh, and uh, like that. Now coming to food demand, cereal dominates our diet and also nutrition. And uh, the, the, we have heard a few representative yesterday that undernutrition is rampant, according to the definition that we used that uh, FAO use 100, 1,800 kilocalorie. But we need to understand India's undernutrition in a cultural context. We, if we divide our population that low income are poor and, and others are high income, we find that even in the rich classes, the consumers are not consuming, but we call is the minimum norm of energy, 1,800 kilocalorie. There is something in the culture of India that Indian eat very less. I visit Australia many a time, USA. I find that uh, even in the entry, my stomach can't take more. So main course, I find that it just goes waste. And most of the Indians are like me, that eating less, very less. So I find that undernutrition and, in, and hunger, we are doing a study now on India. One is involuntary, that people don't, can't afford to buy adequate food. And another large part of it is voluntary, that they can afford to buy food, but still they prefer to, to just consume um, 1,500 calories, 1,600 calories, not 1,800 calories. So this, I just feel that that is not because of shortage of food, that is because of choice. Then uh, we have low level of protein intake, but this is not by choice, this is by compulsion, because, uh, because of green revolution, we lost advantage of pulses to cereals, and per capita availability of pulses, dry beans, lentil, chickpea, um, moong bean, marsh bean. So that has come down from uh, 60 grams uh, per person per day in early 60s to now about 35 grams per person per day. So, so that is not by choice, that is because pulses are not uh, available, their growth rate was lower than population growth rate. So though we are a net exporter, but we are large importer of some of the items, and two items are, one is vegetable oil. India is the largest importer of vegetable oil in the world. Last uh, 12 months, we imported 10 million ton of edible vegetable oil, palm oil, canola oil, soybean oil. So India is a big market for edible oil, and entire South Asia, big market for vegetable oils. Then, dry bean pulses, we are importing 3.5 million ton, but still prices are rising. It is not found to be adequate to meet uh, our requirements. Recently, India has emerged as a big uh, meat exporter. Maybe we will uh, cross uh, Australia. The recent figure I checked yesterday that last, 12, last four quarters, uh, beef export is 1.67 million ton. So that is the latest figure on meat exports. Another important aspects of India that in other country, economic transition has followed, dietary transition has followed economic transition. That when economy grew at 7% uh, for 20 years, you find huge increase in intake of meat, eggs, fish, like that. There is increase in India, but it is very small. Again, I would say that role of cultural factor and like that, that, that we don't find increase in consumption commensurate with the uh, increase in per capita income. Then uh, coming to growth rate of economy, our experience has been uh, different than what is the experience of India, that uh, last uh, few years we just find that our growth rate has accelerated. In fact, uh, 
Indian economy witnessed a deceleration after mid-90s up to 2004-05. But after that, we analyzed it, we put some measure into place, but the biggest factor has been not because government did it, that was terms of trade for agriculture, that prices received by farmers after 2004-05, they started improving and they played a very big role. And we did decomposition of growth in last seven, eight years, and we found that 40% of the increase in output in last seven years in India is because of increase in real prices of agriculture commodities. And again, there is a contrast that real prices we feel have increased, you feel they are not increasing. Uh, rupee has depreciated, so attractive for uh, uh, this uh, foreign exchange. And also we did something on seed and uh, fertilizer and uh, public investment in agriculture, which helped us in raising our growth rate. But still we could not achieve the targeted growth rate, that is 4% for the country as a whole, still we are, we are below it. But as you know, India is a large country, so many states, so we have some of the states which have helped in achieving the national target. Their growth rate has been more than 4%. But we have some states, particularly in eastern India, where water is not a constraint, abundant water, perennial rivers, all those things, UP, Bihar, like that states. So there, the growth rate is very low. So we feel that once those states catch up, then we will be in a position to attain 4% growth rate and for another 10, 15 years, we can remain close to that type of growth rate and, 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 and that then agriculture, um, uh, in fact, seems to be doing better than what has been the long-term growth rate of agriculture in the recent year and we are projecting that next 10, 15 years, we will be able to harness potential of Eastern India, Central India, where productivity is very, very low. So how we will do it? One is that productivity gap. If we look at uh, productivity in other country, you just find, in fact, uh, we are frequently encountered why China productivity is so high, India productivity is so low. So that compared to global average, that global productivity is uh, about 33% uh, uh, higher than what is productivity in India, and China productivity is more than double what is productivity in India. So this is one source. Then second source of productivity increase is but we call attainable yield, that this is probably, we compare the yield at some selected sample farmers uh, with improved technology and what they are getting with their own method of cultivation. We just find that there is a difference varying from 10 to 40%, so without much of the efforts, we can have it, provided prices are attractive. In fact, uh, we are uh, bullish on uh, prices. We feel that uh, price increase terms of trade for agriculture will continue to improve for some more time. And when you have low productivity, then improvement in terms of trade help in achieving two goals. One is increase in output, second is increase in income. But if you are close to plateau, then it helps only in increasing income, but not in increasing agriculture growth or production. So we are, uh, this agriculture remunerative prices, I think, are, we are bullish on it. We feel it will increase and it will be an important source of growth for us. Then second is intensification. Third is diversification toward high value crops. In fact, fruit and vegetable gives about uh, five times more income and productivity compared to cereals. And we are diversifying toward, toward uh, this, kind of, this kind of crops. So if you look at uh, share of high value crops, it is rising area toward fruit and vegetable resources allocated for livestock, they are rising. So that is another source of growth for us. Then also moving technology frontier, we have a wonderful experience in last uh, uh, about uh, 13 years with BT cotton. It's uh, pr production increased almost three times. Then also with hybrid maize. So similar kind of technology we are trying in other places, in other crops also. Now, as I mentioned that in India, dietary transition did not follow economic transition. Still, you find that, uh, that using India's standard, dietary pattern is changing. This is food demand, food intake, not uh, feed intake. So you just find cereal consumption, though low, it is not rising. It is almost at same level, last 16 years. Pulses increased at a very low rate because availability was not there. Edible oil increasing, vegetable fruits increasing then meat, egg, fish, 
they are just increasing. But still, meat consumption just 4 kg per person per year, fish consumption just 4 kg per person per year, and egg consumption only 28 per person per year. So still, livestock intake is very low. No doubt that dietary uh, transition is taking place. Now, looking at this outlook, that what is the outlook for food? What will be the food demand in India next uh, uh, 15 years or up to 2050? We did that, taking into consideration increase in population, urbanization, uh, demographic aspect, and all that. Uh, we didn't do that by using any CG model. We did it in a very simple way. But we did was that we projected that what will be our GDP in 2050? Under three scenario, if our economy grows at same rate at which it grew last, uh, grew last 40 years, or there is a little momentum, 6%, or upside scenario, 8%, so what, is the, what will be our GDP? And corresponding to that, what will be the percent of that income that will be spent on food? Right now, 23% of our income is spent on food, and our projections are that in 2050, average Indian consumer will be spending only 10% on food. So that we treat as a aggregate demand, that that is the aggregate demand in constant prices, how much it will be, it will be growing. Then, then for individual commodities, we just looked at uh, that uh, um, income group uh, in 910, which has same income, but will be income of India in 2050. So what is their consumption pattern? So when we replace the present consumption pattern with their consumption pattern, intake of wheat, meat, and all those things, so that way we calculated what will be the total demand for wheat, rice, uh, eggs, and uh, like that. So these are some of the numbers that how much our population had grown last 40 years and what is likely to happen in the next 40 years. And in fact, this growth in demand which we are expecting is, is, is much, much higher than what is the FAO projection, because we feel that income will play a uh, major role. So we just uh, calculated that historical growth and required growth, so accept uh, this uh, cereals and uh, accept uh, uh, this uh, sugar. So you just find that in most of the crops, our required growth rate to meet our demand will be higher than what we have historically uh, achieved. Then we also uh, tried to decompose total growth in real expenditure in terms of growth in food quantity index and the quality. So about one third of the growth in the demand will be for quality attributes and two third will be for uh, quantity. Uh, resources are a real uh, consideration and uh, uh, we are feeling this uh, water and energy are a, are a really uh, serious constraint. So by 2050, if we have to meet our demand, what kind of increase we require? We will require four-fold increase in land productivity, three-fold increase in water productivity, doubling of energy use efficiency, six-fold increase in labor productivity, and then meeting this low carbon emission requirement and like that. Really a formidable task if we look at 2050, a very, very challenging task. So we are somewhat comfortable in the short run and medium term, but it is a great challenge in the, in the long run. So this is the last slide on outlook, that what is our outlook for trade, uh, that what is our surplus, what is our deficit. So in the short run, short run, when I say short run, this is for our 12 five year plan that up to 2016, 17, India is going to have average surplus of rice four to six million ton. Since we have fluctuation in input, some year it may be two or some year it may be eight. So those fluctuation apart, average export of rice from India up to just next four or five years, we feel it will be around five million ton. We are also now surplus in wheat and uh, two million ton export of wheat on an average. Maize, we have emerged as exporter of maize, corn, so four million ton. Then uh, total cereal, 11 million ton. Pulses, we are deficit. It's an opportunity for Australia to, 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 to tap that market. Dry beans, we are deficit to the extent of 3.5 million ton, which is growing. Edible oil deficit up to the extent of nine million ton. Sugar, we are having export on an average. This is our outlook, four million ton. In the case of fruit, we are both exporting and importing, but uh, fruit demand is rising rapidly. So import are growing faster than export, and ex imports are a little higher than export. 
And uh, these days we get uh, Tasmanian, Washington, Apple, Kiwi, Pier, in all Indian towns, even in the rural areas. So demand for fruit is rising, and fruit import is growing faster than what is growth in export. Vegetable, onion, potato, and many other kind of vegetable, we are, uh, our outlook is that we will continue to export about 2.2 uh, million ton. Meat, uh, average 1.5 million ton, I think for about 10 years, this number may grow, this quantity may grow, because we have a lot of unproductive stock of animal and like that. So after that, it will be determined by the, by the, uh, by the other factor, but till then, we can expect, in fact, our internal projections are that it will touch 2 million ton and then come down and stabilize at uh, around uh, 1.5 million ton or so. Poultry again, surplus of 0 0.8 million ton, fish close to 1 million ton, and dairy milk equivalent, 0 0.8 million tons. But by 2025, we feel that since demand will be growing at, uh, at uh, annually uh, 3 to 4%, so, so this, this uh, our, our export of many commodities will reduce. So India will be addressing its food security in the short to medium term by reducing its surplus, by reducing its exports. But it is a real challenge that after 2025, what are our sources of growth and how we meet our future demands. Thank you very much.